Hello everybody, welcome back to Witch Fix. Today we're taking a look at a book that has been on my shelf for literal years because when I pick books, and I'm not ashamed to admit this, I'm, I'm partially ashamed to admit this, I tend to pick the shorter ones because I can get through more of them, I can create more episodes, more content for you guys in less time. Whereas a longer book tends to tie me up for a couple of weeks and then I fall behind very quickly. Uh, so this was a little bit of a, a struggle for me to get through, mainly because of the length. But it's Beautiful Creatures, which is the first in a four-part series, uh, and it is described as being similar to Twilight and the Hunger Games by the quote from The Guardian on the cover. Um, it kind of doesn't bode well for it then that Twilight and Hunger Games are undeniably more famous. So... Um, We'll see if that is a result of those things being better, or if it is a result of this being less popular because it has witches in it, and for some motherfucking reason, vampires remain more popular than people with literal godlike powers. Not bitter at all. But before that, a word from today's sponsor. Today's sponsor is me! If you've seen my recent video on YouTube, then you'll already know about this. But I do have a novel coming out, a professionally published legitimate novel that will be in bookshops that you can buy if you so choose. It does have witchy content and it's coming out on the 16th of September this year, 2021. So you can go buy a copy. I'm just going to read you the blurb. Uh, the novel itself is called Stranded by Sarah Goodwin, which you already know is my name. The blurb is thus. Eight strangers, one island, a secret you'd kill to keep. When eight people arrive on the beautiful but remote Boyd Seach Island, they are ready for the challenge of a lifetime, to live alone for one year. Eighteen months later, a woman is found in an isolated fishing village. She is desperate to explain what happened to her, how the group fractured and friends became enemies, how they did what they must to survive until the boat came to collect them, how things turned deadly when the boat did not come. But first, Maddie must come to terms with the devastating secret that left them stranded and her own role in the events that saw eight arrive and only three leave. This has been described by the, the website, uh, by the publisher, as a gripping, twisty page-turner about secrets, lies, and survival at all costs. To that, I would like to add, it is also about witchy stuff. The protagonist, Maddie, uh, has a background in botany, and so there's a lot of herb stuff going on, a lot of interesting little tidbits about herb lore, and also the island itself, which is named after that Scottish word that I struggle to pronounce, is the word for witch. It is named for a witch. There is a story connected to a witch and a story as well which Maddie herself invents about this mysterious figure connected to the island. So throughout the novel there are witchy elements so it should be of interest to you. Obviously there are no like magic power boom zap power witches but that's not really my thing so it's not really what I choose to write about. It is very exciting that the book is coming out. I started the podcast because I was so frustrated about not being published. I needed something creative to do, which would get me reading again and, and give me something to focus on and enjoy, really, um, because it was quite a struggle after my first novel got turned down by publishers to kind of motivate myself into doing more. I think the podcast really helped me to develop as a writer and to come up with the ideas that led into creating Stranded as a novel, so it really is like down to you guys and down to your support of the podcast that this book even exists, and it was amazingly thrilling to know that it was going to get published. So it's out on the 16th of September, you should be able to buy it anywhere that you buy books, so that's like Amazon, WH Smith's, Waterstones, you might be able to get it in uh, supermarkets as well, I'll have more details on that later other high street bookshops and hopefully if you uh, want to support independent bookshops and local bookshops you should be able to go in there and they'll be able to like pre-order it for you even if they don't have it in stock. So with that being said if you would like to support the podcast further if you'd like to support me as a writer go out and buy a copy there will be ebooks available which I think will be about 99p um, at least to start with I know that the publisher who's doing the book which is uh, Avon under HarperCollins do put their books like ebooks on offer so that should be really affordable if you'd like to get an ebook version and there'll also be audiobook versions as well if you're more into audiobooks and you can always get out of your like your local library or lending online which i know that doesn't sound like that helps but authors do get money when you do that and take their books out of the library so whatever you can do whatever it is you feel comfortable with even if you just want to share 
the blurb or the book with someone who you know will be interested in it that would be great too i will be posting links on the social medias so on twitter on instagram if you want to share those with people and there'll be a link in the description below where the book can be ordered as well thank you very much for listening and now on with the episode so Beautiful Creatures, the, the first book, is by Cami Garcia and Margaret Stoll. So it has two authors. Um, that's not incredibly rare. Like, there's a lot of books that have two authors, whether they have two authors on the cover or just one name with two people, like, writing under it. Like, uh, PJ Tracy is another one of my, like, favourite thriller authors. That's actually two people. So uh, it, it's not uncommon. But this is essentially... Twilight, but with witches. Not to do it a disservice, but that sort of broadly strokes in like where we're going to be. But it is written from the male perspective. Our main character is Ethan Waite for, for most of the uh, novel, and his love interest is Lena Duchesne. Duchesne? Not sure. Uh, but she's basically the witch in this scenario, and he is just, you know, Bella Swan, the mortal person. Now, I initially wanted to read this book because I had already seen the movie several years ago, and they did make a movie. They only made one. So, again, if you look at sort of like Twilight and Hunger Games, the things that this is being compared to, they got all of their books made into movies. This got one movie which made no money. I think it actually lost money, and then they didn't make the rest. And I knew I'd seen that movie at least three years before I started the podcast, so I barely remember anything about it. But when I was at a car boot sale, I saw a copy of it. And then a couple of stores later, I saw a copy of the book. And I was like, aha, this is meant to be. And then I decided I needed to read the book before I watched the movie again. And then three years later, here we are. So the blurb. Is falling in love the beginning or the end? In Ethan Waite's hometown, there lies the darkest of secrets. There is a girl. Slowly, she pulled the hood from her head. Green eyes, black hair, Alina Duquesne. There is a curse. On the 16th moon, the 16th year, the book will take what it's been promised, and no one can stop it. In the end, there is a grave. Lena and Ethan become bound together by a deep, powerful love, but Lena is cursed, and on her 16th birthday, her fate will be decided. Ethan never even saw it coming. So, that blurb doesn't tell us a huge amount. I I'm going to quickly fill in a few details so ethan lives in a small town in the deep south called gatlin where nothing ever changes and nothing abnormal ever happens and everything is ruled by this kind of very conservative small town small-mindedness kind of vibe uh, his best friend link's mum is sort of the leader of like the daughters of the revolution i feel like that's what it was called but basically just like the the women's auxiliary of, of this area and everything is completely normal except for the town shut in mason ravenwood who lives in a mansion and no one ever sees him but they don't talk about him until his niece turns up who is lena and starts going to the high school ethan quickly falls in love with her and then secrets begin to be revealed the, the big sort of impetus behind the plot is the fact that on Lena's 16th birthday, she is either going to go light or she is going to go dark. And most witches or casters, which is what the, the book refers to them as, um, get to choose if they want to be good or evil, essentially, whether they go light or whether they go dark. But in Lena's family, things are a bit different. You don't know what you're going to be until your 16th moon, which is your 16th birthday. And at that point, you're either claimed by the darkness or claimed by light due to this curse on her family. And we get to see the consequences of this in her cousin Ridley, who went dark uh, sort of shortly before Lena because uh, she's a little bit older. But she now has glowing yellow cat eyes and is a complete sociopath. So that's not good. And Lena is terrified that that is her fate on her birthday. So she doesn't really want to get involved with Ethan. And Ethan wants to try and save her from this fate. And that's basically what the novel is about. About like 150 pages in, they start trying to work on this. She comes clean about being a witch and... They try and get to the bottom of what caused the curse, how to maybe subvert the curse, and a load of other family secrets. Now, I said this book was long. It is... how long is it? 
563 pages, which is pretty chunky, considering this is like um, one in a four book series. It definitely reads as being quite long, it moves along at quite a lackadaisical pace. Having said that, I didn't really get bored with it, it just has a very broad focus. So instead of it just being about like Bella going to high school and seeing Edward, it's all about this town, it's unravelling centuries worth of family secrets, it has a massive cast of characters um, to introduce and a lot of lore as well. Not just about casters, both dark and light, but also about various like folk traditions of magic for mortals, the secret caster library, which um, is only available when the real town library is closed, all the stuff about Ethan's family because his mother died uh, shortly before the, the, the start of the book and his dad is sort of slowly unravelling in his grief and also all the history and stuff behind the curse itself and like Ethan's family history. There's a huge amount packed into this novel, so although I feel like it could have been cut back by like maybe a hundred pages, there would still be a lot of stuff that you would need to pack into it, so the length is perhaps justified. In its favour, I do find Ethan a much more interesting protagonist than I did Bella from Twilight, because he has a personality, and isn't that just fucking refreshing? Um, I think it's the fact that he is from this town, he's not like an outsider, so we get a lot of information through him and that makes it feel like he's a lot more richer and interesting than, you know, this new girl who's just arrived to a new town, who is someone that you're meant to be able to, like, project yourself onto. Like, Ethan's definitely a character in his own right. And I do also think that the love story in this is a lot more fleshed out than it is in other teen romance books. They're not just in love at first sight because they are. Although, you know, they do kind of have elements of that. But they do spend a lot of time talking to each other, sharing things about their history. Um, they spend sort of evenings looking up at the stars and talking about their dreams and wishes. And it's all very lovely, I guess, if you're a teenager. But at least they are talking to each other and getting to know each other. And that's something that has been missing from some other teen romance novels that I have read. So it is kind of, if not 100% believable to me, at least more believable than most other teen romances that I have read or seen. The part of the book that kind of disappointed me a little bit was the ending, which in a book that's over 500 pages long is a little bit annoying because you've worked real hard to get to that ending. You've read a lot, you've absorbed a lot of lore, you want to see what's going to happen. I've already told you the blurb, you know the flashpoint is coming on her 16th birthday, you would expect huge decisive things to happen at that point. And some things do, but a lot of things don't. For example, it kind of felt to me like a bit of a cop-out that at the end of the book, massive spoilers incoming, Lena isn't claimed for dark or light. It feels like a little bit of a cheat, because we've been told this whole time, you know, you have to be dark or light and you don't get a choice. Well, at the end of the book, she's told that she's been lied to her entire life. She does get a choice, but if she chooses to go light, all of the dark casters in her family will die. And if she chooses to go dark, all of the light casters in her family would die. And given what I told you about her cousin being a complete sociopath, you would think this would be an easy choice to make. But the thing is, her uncle, Mason, who is like the, the main guy on her side, is a dark creature. He's not a caster, really. He's more of a... Well, at various points he gets likened to a vampire, but we're told that he's an incubus, which I think is a sex demon, but in this he eats dreams. So he's kind of like the BFG, but neither big nor friendly nor giant. And he will die if she chooses the side of light. So obviously that gives her a little bit of a wobble. But at the same time, should it? Because there's a lot more people depending on her going light than going dark. Even Mason himself is saying, you know, I don't really mind that much. I knew this was coming. I knew the decision you'd have to make. So I'm prepared. And then and another massive spoiler incoming. He does die. Uh, through a choice that Lena like directly makes that isn't turning light or dark it's much aside from that but he dies and yet still Lena doesn't choose light or dark we kind of end the book without the confrontation 
between herself and the, the dark casters and her family who for the whole book are trying to manipulate her and force her into choosing their side. They just disappear from the scene unharmed and it's like you can feel the plans for the sequel being made. You can feel all the pieces being withdrawn from the board and put away carefully and saved for another day at the expense of actually finishing this game that we've set up over 500 pages. And it did leave me a little bit cold towards the novel. I did feel like I had been awaiting this confrontation. And I think I could have been happier with it if there had been maybe more decisiveness on Lena's part. If maybe she had been prevented from making this decision somehow as opposed to just not making it. Which I feel is going to lead to a lot of consequences to read about in future books. It just felt like for all that Ethan is his own character... Lena kind of suffers from being a little bit plot-led in places where she's just stupid when she needs to be stupid, indecisive when she needs to be indecisive, and doesn't make logical decisions because the plot relies on her not doing that. So basically, at the end of the book, she ends up with one eye of either colour, and it's kind of insinuated that she's been claimed by either both light and dark, or like neither light and dark, but therefore also both. It's a little bit confusing. There's a sort of brief section at the end of the novel where we get things from Lena's perspective, which just muddies the waters even further. So there's that going on. It also kind of bothered me, and this is just a really nitpicky thing, that throughout the novel we hear this song being played in various different places called 16 Moons. And it's sort of like a prophecy of what's happening to Lena. It's like 16 moons, 16 fears. 16 does what 16 nears i forget but and they keep saying like it's her 16th moon but there are 12 moons in a year y'all they they act like the moon only comes around once every year is it a special moon i'm confused um but yeah she she she, she shouldn't be on her 16th moon that means she's like 18 months old no 14 months old 16 months 16 months i can't math good so that just bothered me a little bit and the fact that we're basically told that the way that Lena manages to avoid being claimed slash be claimed by both is that she just hides the moon away in the sky. So the moon isn't overhead. And again, that feels like a bit of a cheat. She doesn't really do anything or strike a bargain or reverse the curse or do anything really to actually cleverly do this it's just like oh no well i'm just not gonna look at the moon and then i don't have to choose also the fact that we're told the whole novel that everyone in her family can't choose and then like right at the end we're told oh actually lena can because she's a special kind of witch and we're told that the first of this kind which is called a natural basically just means you're super powerful without trying the first of the their kind will go dark and the second one will be allowed to choose um, and it just feels like a lot of very heavy machinations have gone through just to make this a plot point. It felt a bit jumbled, a bit confusing, a bit like we'll just add in this clause quickly at the end of the prophecy, which until this point had been quite clear cut. So it was a little bit annoying at the end, a little bit fiddly, a little bit of new information being thrown at us. So that was a little bit annoying, but for the most part, up until that point, I was having a pretty good time. I enjoyed Ethan's kind of like wry comments on his small town in America. The fact that everyone's so obsessed with, you know, the Civil War, the South, the Confederacy, how they call it the war of like northern aggression. And everyone is very in each other's business and knows each other's secrets and all of this stuff, which is quite fun and funny in his like interior monologue it's just like the plot at the end kind of let that down a little bit and my enjoyment waned considerably aside from the casters and the mortals and the incubuses um we do have one other mysterious force in the novel and that is in the shape of amma who is ethan's i guess kind of surrogate mother throughout the novel she appears to be just like his dad's housekeeper but she's just there all the time takes care of ethan has known the family for years 
she's also like i guess a practitioner of something like voodoo i don't know if they ever actually call it that but it, it's heavily influenced by like ancestor worship she refers to her ancestors as the greats and they give her special powers and special abilities i think at one point they teleport her to like the main events at the end of the novel so that she can be there because she's needed and also she has the abilities to see into the future she makes various protective charms from like bones and sachets of dirt and stuff and, and gives them to ethan and lena throughout the book to try and like protect them from what's coming she is kind of a counterpoint to Mason Ravenwood. So you've got him on one side trying to control things and protect Lena, and you've got her on the other side trying to control things and protect Ethan. That's basically her purpose in the novel. She also seems to be related to someone who was involved in the original curse, so um, obviously her tie is going back to that point. I kind of wish we got more information about her and what her whole like deal was what she was actually practicing and how i found that quite interesting and would have appreciated you know more of it but she does kind of disappear in the second half of the novel she isn't around much so that was a little disappointing overall i'd say it's a really enjoyable book it does occasionally get a bit bogged down in the teen romance for my liking but that is the genre so it is what it is and the ending is a little bit disappointing because obviously it has to go into those sequels and all of that noise um i did find the lore of casters to be interesting enough but not particularly like groundbreaking it doesn't do a huge amount of things i would say like new and innovative aside from you know having to choose between good and evil which happens in a lot of other franchises everywhere so there's that the setting is pretty original and interesting it has a touch of the southern gothics about it which i enjoyed but i can see why this isn't as popular as like hunger games or twilight because those things are very direct and plot driven and they have very i'm gonna say stable law like you get told something and then that thing continues to be true um so you know you learn things about like the different districts and although you may learn other things later on the original things continue to be true you learn things about what vampires are and vampires do and that high vampire council that are evil and all that stuff and those things continue to be true whereas i feel like the lore in this one is a lot more slippery and subject to changes or alterations or sudden deviations throughout the plot it feels like a lot more to get on with and i think just the sheer length and complexity of this book would make it more off-putting to like teenage readers uh who also as this like is a genre aimed mostly at girls might not want to read a, a book series with a boy as the protagonist uh so i think maybe all those factors kind of factor into it not being as popular and also you know I guess witches weren't really going through the renaissance that vampires were at the point that this came out. Why are vampires so popular? I just don't get it. They quite literally suck. Anywho, I'm going to go off now and finally watch the movie uh, of, uh, of this book again. I did Google it while I was reading the book just because I'd forgotten the name of one of the actresses in the picture on the cover and it was driving me mad. Um, I googled it and apparently it like cost like 60 million or something to make and then it only basically made that back so it made a loss essentially and then they didn't make any more and also it was quite poorly received and reviewed so I can't really remember why or how I felt about it when I watched it but a good indication is the fact that I no longer own the original version that I had on DVD and I think I only watched it once so clearly something happened in that that i didn't enjoy but i hope that because it is like a standalone movie maybe they had some inkling before it like came out or was made that it was going to be on its own and therefore they gave it more of a decisive ending so maybe that will improve the plot maybe it won't i don't know we'll see in the meantime if you'd like me to review the rest of the books in this series uh, they are quite long, so I kind of don't want to, but if this video gets enough likes, then I probably will at least purchase the next one and read it, so we'll play it by ear, and in the meantime, I'll see you in the next one.